very welcome to our EU foreign policy facing new realities, cost network enter final conference virtually today. In the morning, we have a webinar with Professor Natalia Shaban. Very warm well welcome, Natalia. And she's director of political communication and public diplomacy forum. She's also president of Ukrainian Studies Association of Australia and New Zealand and the co-editor of the peer-reviewed Australian and New Zealand Journal of European Studies. Her research focus interdisciplinary on cognitive and semiotic aspects of political and media discourse on images and perception studies with the EU and IR context. And she's very well known for her public diplomacy and political communication studies. She published so widely that I cannot even touch upon all her work in very high impact journals, please. Feel free to have a look at all her publications. And in our cost network enter, she's working group two, co-leader on perceptions and communications. Natalia, the floor is yours. Well, first of all, thank you very much to Nick, to the network for initiating something several years ago, something great, something fantastic, something that brought people from so many different countries together and gave opportunity to so many scholars, experienced early career scholars. And um, so thank you to Mick and to Patrick for going ahead with this initiative for securing such a great network. And I think even though we're finishing, but it's not the finish to our interactions, not the finish to our collaboration, if would this network only solidified and cemented so many, um, so many links were already had, but also introduced it to wonderful new colleagues. I want to say a big thank you to my uh, co-leader, actually I'm the vice leader, but the leader of uh, work group two, Perceptions and Communication is Jan Sichka, who is there. So it was a pleasure to work with Jan all these years. And um, this presentation is one of the outputs of the work group two, but to say that it's, you know, it's just one of many and um, again, always wonderful to work with you and with Mick because uh, we, in this particular work package, we worked all together. So thank you. Thank you for dear colleagues for joining the Zoom and I hope if you're watching it, uh, thank you for watching it. Uh, I will start with the sharing. So when we were talking about um, one of possible contribution to the final conference, we talked about, um, because the work package deals with the perceptions and communication, uh, I proposed um, a, a topic which is sits perhaps heavier on the chair of communication, political communication, international political communication at times of conflict. And um, that's sort of one of the main inspirations. And um, that um, correlates with one of my research projects here at the University of Canterbury. I lead a sort of what I call diffused research center on diplomacy and political public diplomacy and political communication. And um, also in my role of a president of the Australian New Zealand um, Association of Ukrainian Studies, we also had a series of events dedicated to understanding the Russian aggression against Ukraine in 2022, the escalation of aggression, but of course that wasn't the beginning where the war started earlier. The war started as we know in 2014. So uh, I hope that after my presentation, we could spend time with questions and answers. I'm looking forward to your feedback. And um, yeah, here we go. We'll start with a little bit of, um, so this was an insight to the theory of mass media and mass communication. And in the field of communication studies, it's an axiom, it's a well-known fact that mass media are always drawn to war. If it bleeds, it leads. Drama, tragedy, sensation, scandals, they are always in place to help to sell the news. That's one of the beliefs by the media professionals that that negativity, 
the drama, the tragedy will leave a bigger impact on the readers, on the audiences, will stay longer with them in their memory, will have a much stronger emotional impact. There is, a, there is some truth to this, and it sits with the cognitive science. In the world of cognitive science, it's well known that we process emotions in different hemispheres of our brain. We process negative emotion and that part of the brain is a faster reaction. It also sits in the particular place where it is easily activated. Um, and it also leaves a deeper imprint with stronger, stronger neuron connections, which are more difficult to destroy. You will ask why? And this is because we as human beings are wired to um, face the threat, the danger, the risk immediately in order to survive. So we are wired by our own evolution to react in a much stronger, powerful way to negative information and keep it longer and um, um, have an emotive attachment to it, while the positive information sits in a different part of the brain. So somewhere subconsciously, the newsmakers over centuries realized that correlation. In his seminal work, reflecting on World War I, Laszlo, in his book from 1927, wrote, paper placard only needs to put a great battle for sales to mount. But it's also known through the 20th century, and especially as we move into the 21st century, that um, audiences, specifically in the Western type liberal democratic media environments, have little patience for long and costly wars with no clear threat. And um, it's sort of difficult to keep audiences' interests for a long time with those wars happening somewhere far, far away. And they don't, they, they do not seem to um, impact the life of the citizens in these faraway countries. If you think the war in Syria is going for, what, 10 years? Um, it's not the headline news. Maybe potentially at some point, and in some regions it could be, but overall, if you look at the global coverage, it's sort of not there. The same happened to the war in the east of Ukraine, which started in 2014. It made big big splashes in the beginning in 2014, 2013, 2014, 2015. And then it was reported, but it was reported in such a um, um, minuscule, not main attention way that lots of people around the world stopped following. They, yes, in some regions, in some countries, it was still, it was still sort of in the core of the news, but potentially not the headline news. But for many countries in the world, and I wouldn't be afraid to say in New Zealand, that war became truly an invisible war of Europe. These are the visual quotations from The Guardian from 2022. The escalation of aggression, uh, which started in February 2022, definitely has attracted a lot of media attention. And these are just some quotes to demonstrate that tragedy, drama, uh, which keep drawing attention of the global media to the war in Ukraine, and I will say traditional media. I'm sure you've heard about the liberation of Izum, a township in the east, and discovery of the mass graves with 450 people in them. So it's a photograph from that um, painful, um, the traumatic, painful. Uh, location. I'm sure you were following earlier events in Mariupol and heard of the environments of the maternity ward, that, that picture of that poor woman um, on the stretcher made it around the world. And it was very dramatic and then the, the look of desperation or even sort of abandoning the hope is on her face. And it's a very powerful emotional picture. Or victorious Ukrainian soldiers after liberating a city in the east of Ukraine in the recent September counteroffensive, sort of glory, victory, celebration, very high emotions. And so if you go to the New York Times, the Guardian, the Washington Post, the Jazeera Post's um, main 
media around the world who have 24 seven news cycle. The news about um, the ongoing war in Ukraine in 2022 remain on the tops of the charts. But what I've noticed in New Zealand, it's sort of have started disappearing. It's still there within the world news, but it stopped hitting the, the top lines on e-news platforms, on front pages of newspapers or primetime television news. Well, before February, March, April, it was a lot of it. Uh, Ukraine came in a major way. So that's sort of to, towards my argument that if, if it's seemingly a location far away, there is no direct threat, the interest will go down. My argument, of course, that the, the war in Ukraine demonstrates how even far away locations are affected uh, by this. We all know that Ukraine is a brain, brain basket of the world. Maybe people didn't know about it, but now they're knowing about it. The, the prices on fuel and energy affecting the whole world, the trade routes, it's, it's affecting more than just immediate region in Europe or even to the transatlantic. So there is, there is definitely a connection. And I think um, that's sort of there, but I'm observing New Zealand coverage. My argument here, what happened was my big question rather than an argument, but what happened in 2014 and 2015? We had all the ingredients for media to keep going on was the top coverage and keep attracting the interest from the rest of the world. We had okay, Euromaidan events, which again, they were powerful in its message, Ukraine's European choice, Ukraine's um, people expressing their will. But at the same time, we know they, they, those were tragic events because 100 people died on, on, on the Maidan and so, you know, we, we know about that. Then in March, we have annexation of Crimea. This is the grab of land, the first grab of land in Europe since World War II. It's a, it's a huge event in geopolitical terms, in historical terms. Yes, it is discussed, but as we all know, the world moved on. The, Olymp the Winter Olympic Games happened in the Russian Federation and people went skiing. Um, the summit skipped ahead, go, went ahead, inviting the president of the Russian Federation. So the world sort of closed the eyes and looked through the fingers. Yes, there were sanctions, yes, there were reactions. This is it's a huge event. And there was that spike in coverage in media and then roll back. No, this, no, nobody, no more discussions, nothing. It sort of was, was gone from the media agenda. Then we have another tragic event in the spring 2014, MH17 was more than 300 people on board. And they're not even citizens of Ukraine or the Russian Federation. Um, we know that, that, that there was a huge reverberation. Huge news. And then again, it disappeared from news agendas and um, sort of gone. Then the war starts in the east of Ukraine. It's a hybrid war, atrocities, tanks, shootings, surroundings, um, taking POWs, huge events for, again, capture attention for a little bit, disappear. Humanitarian crisis of 2014, 2015, when millions of Ukrainians start moving from the East and South, relocation, all these are major ingredients. So my big question is, why didn't the world react in the same way it reacted to events in 2022? We still keep talking about it. There are ongoing webinars, seminars. Of course, academics are always interested. I'm talking about a different level. Stakeholders, the general public, we're talking about people who are not interested in international relations, politics, or communication in general. They're just the consumers of these events. In 2014, Ukraine did not end up with an insanely popular perception around the world. This global soft power index run by brand finance, they have lots of categories and indices for analysis. They tell us that in 2022, we have an interesting situation where global perceptions of Ukraine see a massive shift as a result of the Russian invasion. So the extraordinary 44% of global respondents say that they are familiar with Ukraine. They were not familiar before. They think that Ukraine is influential, so that it grows by 24%. 
And they think that Ukraine has a, a solid reputation that grows by 12%. But also what is noticed in this particular survey that in areas which are not directly related to the conflict, the perceptions of Ukraine uh, are growing up. There's a positive knock-on effect on the nation's perceptions across most other global soft power index matrix. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen in 2014, even though Ukraine was a victim. It was an unjust situation. Ukraine tried to fight. Um, there was some global coverage. Maybe it disappeared for some time, but that did not result in this. But now we have this. So the question is why? What is different this time than when it's different from 2014? The simple answer here is that um, there are many different factors. In fact, there is a constellation of factors. And the answers, I'm sure your answers will potentially will be different from my answers, depending what discipline you're coming from, what your research is about. My answer to this question comes from the area of international political communication. And I dissect in this presentation only one factor which I argue contributes to a different perception of Ukraine and the world in 2022. And this answer comes in the factor in focus. That's the very different information flows in the new media ecology. And that's what where I see one of potential inputs. And again, we could we could talk and see how different types of inputs also play against each other here. But this is this is sort of my limitation. This is my very narrow focus. This is one factor I'm trying to dissect in my presentation. Before I go into the actual case of Ukraine, I still have to dissect a little bit of concepts and theories, again, from the field of international political communication. If we want to understand information flows in the new media ecology, we need to look into the functions of media when it comes to matters of war and peace, uh, be it about conflict ongoing, prevention of conflict, peace building, or intervention. Um, so this is sort of a summary of a substantial body of literature in the field, um, the several functions of media. So when it comes to war and peace media, be it traditional media, meaning press, magazines, journals, be it traditional broadcast media, television or radio, or new traditional media, which is e-versions of normal traditional media, e-versions of hard copy newspapers, e-versions of radio shows, e-versions of TV programs. So one of the functions is to be a watchdog. It is about digging deeper and look into um, some hidden stories. We're talking about obviously media environments in democratic, uh, in democratic environments, but even in autocratic environments, digging for hidden stories, providing feedback on local problems potentially could prevent the conflict because media professionals and opinion making could unearth some storylines which potentially discover different interests, potential selfish interests, which then push some stakeholders into saying, no, we're not doing it. This is a so watchdog. Watchdog is a well-known function of media necessarily when it comes to war and peace, but especially when it comes to methods of war and peace. The second function is a gatekeeper. Well, as I just mentioned, we don't hear about all the wars in the world. We hear about some wars. We hear about more than about other wars. So by choosing which wars to report and how to report and how much to report, media sets, media means sit in them. They also filter issues. And um, yeah, by, by even in autocratic societies, uh, see themselves as balanced and fair, but I'm sure you've heard balanced and fair. About and so there's that self-vision thinking that mm, we, we, we have a balanced outlook onto the world or onto the local problems. So we learn about the world through the choices media professionals are making for us. Then um, media 
could work as policy makers, and I'm sure you all heard about the so-called CNN effect. The CNN effect became possible due to development of technology because of satellite TV, because of the cable TV. Media could report about the wars and specifically about the Iraq war in a way never imagined before. It was in real time. The whole world was sitting in front of TVs good to the, because they never seen it before. We, we, we know there is reporting about the war all the time. Um, in, for yeah, the images about the war, something not new for people who study media or general public. But in the past, it would take a long time for the reel from Vietnam to fly by the plane to make it to the TV station. It would take some time for editing, for anchors to write their text, and only then it would go. There was a delay. There was always a delay in reporting the war. But for the first time, they seen technical capabilities in Iraq because they had on the ground, they had satellite capabilities and they could connect um, satellites. They were showing what's happening on the ground in real time. And politicians never had that input before. And so the development of technology pushed media into a new role. They were the ones who were informing policymakers, and the policymakers had to react not to other policy, but media. And in a different story, um, they, the media inputs were shaping policy response. And from now on, policymakers in democratic states are always careful about what is there in the policies they are making, Shalim, could be seen by the general public not corresponding to the messages. Okay, so we, you understand what I'm uh, talking about here. So media can set um, policies and it's known as a CNN effect and also agendas. Very briefly to the last two fun uh, functions, it's also about being a diplomat because in the side of the, very often two sides of the conflict, they don't talk to each other. So in this situation, media may serve the um, channel location between the two sides that officially may not talk to each other, but media has the power to present the other side, the other position, finally the bridge builder to lessen the polarization between the groups and depict the other side as human beings with the same types of problems, potentially with the same interests potential was the same position. It's very important in um, peace building. So after the conflict is over or conflict prevention. What is important for us to remember is that new media ecology, because of internet, because we have so much information, all these functions are now sort of magnified several times because of, 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 of this insane um, in ocean of information we can have instantly, immediately. And so this new media ecology comes to, to, to media with opportunities and challenges. The opportunities are about that bridge building. Uh, in social media, internet allows to allow us to between each other very fast. We can also mobilize faster and political publics can become activated very, very quickly. So if you think about the war in Ukraine this time, and you think about how the whole world mobilized in solidarity movement so quickly, think about internet. In a very short period of times, big masses of people around the world united in, sol in message of solidarity, but with this, they also ex exerted some pressures on the local um, leaders, on the local policy makers. And in many ways, political response, same thing in effect, was um, quick, but also in a way that correlated with this mobilization effort by the general public around the world. Another point is access for ordinary citizens. So new media ecology allows simple citizens to circumvent traditional channels. A soldier from the front can tweet to the president of Ukraine saying, hey, we need more of the bulletproof vests, or we and the president replies. So in all the times that would be impossible, there is a chain of command. You don't tweet to the president, you don't want Facebook to do it. Now it is possible and it empowers, it emancipates 
citizens. There are other examples around the world, but in case of Ukraine, we do see the, the, the networked warfare. We see how networks are so important. And the tool of internet is very good for that sort of networked reality. And Ukraine finds itself more and more, be it the warfare, be it the civil society, be it information spreading. But of course, there are some negatives, and this is well known to us all. It is about the impoverishment of social capital, and it's known in, in our lingo, selectivism, collectivism. And when people watch a, a video and then they just click, I like it, and they think, oh, I've participated, I've expressed my support, so done, 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 done. But it's sort of that passive position sitting on the sofa, clicking, and no in moderation in some regions they introduced fine and even arresting people for clicking posts which were was anti-war messages so if somebody clicked i like to um, and so sometimes collectivism is an act of civil bravery we all heard about mis and dis and malinformation echo chambers polarization yes yes this is one of the negatives and finally i should mention digital inequality we sort of assume that everybody has smartphones. We sort of assume that everybody's on the same game, but it's not so for many countries in the world. Also, if you think about the war in Ukraine, how the electric power stations are constantly targeted by the Russian missiles, it means that people in those areas might not have access to internet and not have access to information. And so uh, the infrastructure is not just about fridges or light, or um, you know, running home and devices, it's also cutting off information. And so this, this, this is an aspect to keep in mind because it is about power relations. I control your access to information. So something um, uh, which is, so my argument here is that the leadership of um, Ukraine in 2022 has embarked on a much more successful um, strategic communication strategy than, in 2014 and 2015, and pretty much all the ingredients were there, but the global opinion did not move as much as it moved in 2022. And again, you can say, but the stakes are different now. Well, if you think that 2014 and 2015 are quite, quite high stakes there too. Uh, argument number one, um, this particular conflict demonstrates uh, one thing that the image of Ukraine, image of president as I call it. We have an interesting strategy surrounding the, the, the president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky. As you know, he himself, uh, he's a lawyer by education, uh, but he himself comes from, he, he changed his profession, he became a professional in, entertainer and a business, uh, a successful business person from, in, from entertainment industry. So he um, he, he worked with the same team for many years. He was always with the team. That's it's a, it's an interesting relationship uh, because that's he always been loyal to his team members. He, he didn't abandon them when he was proposed a very lucrative position in the Moscow entertainment, in the Moscow entertainment industry many years ago. He said, but I cannot come on board if I'm not taking my team. And it's like, fine, whatever, we don't need the team, it's just you. And he's like, no, I'm, 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 I'm not going without my team. And so he, he left that very lucrative post, went to Ukraine and created a very successful entertainment industry. So he, by his background, understands the importance of good communication and good communication channels. So there's this background, but, you know, this background and you may never use it. So what we see here, uh, the president as a communicator, he, again, this is the new media ecology reality where we see the president interacting with wounded soldiers, workers at the hospital, soldiers on the front line. He went to the hospital in the law to a hospital, so impressed that Zelensky is just so the, the, the next um, point is um, how Zelensky interacts with the traditional media professionals. It's many photos here demonstrate his style. He's sitting on the same level. He's talking to them. 
he is um, he's one of them, and uh, he is very active in talking to the Western leading Western media who's been telling the story of Ukraine, being impressed by this direct contact with the president who sleeps, I think, three hours a day at the moment. Even in New Zealand, um, journalist Tova came to Kiev to interview Zelensky, and it was um, a very nice interview. You can watch it online if you want. Um, understanding the power of uh, strong visual messages and also the power of YouTube on the 9th of May to um, uh, commemorate those who perished in World War II. Zelensky makes a very powerful 15 minute video. You can see the front short, it's very powerful. It's framed in a very dramatic way. And it was, it went viral. It was uh, watched by more than a million of, of, of viewers. Every evening he goes on YouTube where he greets citizens of Ukraine with an address and where he analyzes the developments of the day which has just passed. And these messages are also important sources of information for the global traditional media who then take and quote him. Then something which um, Zelensky became known as virtual diplomacy. It is a case study uh, which occupies attention of digital diplomacy scholars, but um, it, it is also an interesting case for communication scholars. This is, he reaches to policymakers. He addresses the US Congress, German Bundestag, Knesset of Israel, Italian Parliament, European Parliament, everywhere standing ovations. And he addressed more parliaments. I just didn't have enough space on my um, slide to demonstrate it. It's a very new way of addressing it is again using the new media ecology internet um, sort of in the world we're used to zoom used to visual images from but leaders didn't used to do it that much and with that regularity. What is also special that every time he addresses a parliament uh, a policy making community he addresses it with a narrative which is very related to place. Uh, it's about uh, messages which resonate very well with local narratives. Virtual diplomacy is not only towards policymakers. There is differentiation and diversification reaching to stakeholders and opinion makers. For example, uh, when this uh, autumn New York Stock Exchange opened its trade, you know, they usually ring a bell. This year, the traders came to wait for the bell to ring, and suddenly, instead of a bell, the went up and Zelensky was there greeting the traders of New York Stock Exchange and it was a big surprise for everyone hearing the bell. He pre greeted since 2022. He greeted the Cannes Film Festival a community, Venice Film Festival, uh, a, a, a standing ovations every time. So this time you would say, oh, who cares about uh, Grammys? These are the pop singers or these filmmakers. He himself understands the power of people of entertainment in forming opinions, including political messages. Uh, something which Ukraine didn't do in the past a lot, but now it actively engages in the celebrity diplomacy. This is um, just a small gallery of celebrities who met with Zelensky, Jessica Chastain, Ben Stiller, Sean Penn, Alain Delon. These are obviously um, just snippets of information, but um, these are people famous in their own circles with their own followers, big fans uh, base, and um, that's the. Um, I'm sorry, um, sorry, I. Okay, um, then um, in an interesting twist, I'm sure you followed in very recent news, but this is Mark Hamill who played Luke Skywalker in the Star Wars. He is now heading an initiative to collect money for to purchase uh, new drones for the uh, army of Ukraine. And um, he is presenting it in the narrative of collecting drones to fight the evil empire. So fiction and reality are mixing together, but this narrative is very well known. And so the metaphor of the evil empire is suited, suitable. I can mention other celebrities, including political celebrities, Boris Johnson, this goes on and on, the president of Poland Duda, but um, recently Zelensky, Zelensky's exchange with Elon Musk in, in Twitter 
about some interpretations of history are also interesting. Potentially, we could discuss them in Q&A. Well, um, talking about strategic communication is not only President himself. At the moment, we have quite a number of um, very sort of powerful strategic communicators who work together with the President, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, Dmitro Kuleba, who is a public diplomacy diplomat. So he came to big diplomacy through the public diplomacy, was voted the best diplomat 2017. He is with strategic communication background. Recently in New York, he meets was the, the was the was the host of the of the satirical show, um, Stephen Colbert. And of course, Stephen is a super popular person with this big fan base on traditional TV, but also on YouTube because the show is shown on YouTube. And of course, with lots of followers and reactions after that. So here we go. Not only Dmitro Kuleba engages with Stephen Colbert, for example, Jacinda Ardern from New Zealand is a regular uh, visitor to the show. Uh, on the, in the middle, you can see the photo of Mikhailo Podolak, who is advisor of the president of Ukraine. He is a journalist in the past. He is very uh, straightforward. He speaks very well, very educated. He's the guy next door. Uh, very, very sincere, engaging, not afraid of difficult questions, fast speaking. A very different style to Dmitro Kuleba, who is um, a seasoned diplomat and has a different style of presentation. He had millions of followers. Advisor to the office of the president, Alexei Aristovich, is another, another um, interesting phenomenon in Ukraine's strategic communication. Um, with a military background in the past, he is also, he was a military intelligence, he was scout. He is also a trained psychologist. He's also a professional actor. He's also a blogger. Every evening, he appears for a 45-minute broadcast with a Russian opposition lawyer, Mark Fagan, and their audiences are enormous. We're talking half a million at one go. He's a provocateur. He's soft-spoken. He is um, he's not afraid to say some controversial things. He he's, sometimes does it intentionally. People are reacting. Um, very different style to Mikhailo Podolak or to Dmitro Kuleba. So three of them are quite powerful strategic communicators. They all have interesting sense of humor, very different from each other. But that's something I would like to note, the sense of humor, which might not be necessarily something you mentioned when you talk about the war. But I think that really helps them to connect with the audiences very well, different senses of humor. As you know, during the changes in the Russian Federation media environment, one of the main changes was to cut off Twitter and Facebook. YouTube was very close to be cut off, but then they didn't. So one of the reasons lots of entertainment is on YouTube and uh, they didn't want to um, antagonize the general public who loves shows on YouTube, movies, entertainment shows. So the YouTube bloggers become a very important channel to communicate specifically with the uh, citizens in the Russian Federation as well as with the Russian speakers around the world. So these Ukrainian YouTube bloggers have different niches. Zhdanov, it's military analytics. Uh, Yakovina, it's international relations. Symboluk, uh, focus on Russian propaganda. And there are more of them. I just don't want to overburden you, but that's the idea. They, they actually broadcast session intentional in order to the audiences involve people from the former Soviet Union including the Russian Federation. Then we have a different genre when Ukrainian commentators are working together with Russian exiled opposition commentators. Those commentators had millions of audiences online before the conflict. Mark Fagan, who is a lawyer, Andrei Piankovsky, PhD in physics and mathematics, currently political scientist working with Atlantic Council in the United States. Yulia Latinina, a writer, a historian. Evgeny Chichvarkin, a billionaire, a Russian billionaire who makes whiskey. He has a distillery in London, but he's also a very pro-Ukrainian commentator. Alexander Nevzorov, famous TV journalist, Michael Naki, um, former TV journalist, um, currently in exile. So all of them are in exile, all of them are in opposition to the current regime, all are pro-Ukrainian, all of them are intellectuals uh, with the, um, very, they're 
they're powerful communicators. They have deep thoughts. They sometimes talk to each other. But in all of these, you can see how Ukrainian commentators are getting engaged and tapping into more and more audiences who are already following these uh, intellectuals who chose uh, to be in opposition um, to the current regime. Um, more things happening in online world, the so-called psyops or psychological operations. Uh, some of them are memes, for example, like this character of a Ukrainian peasant uh, tagging uh, or tagging the, the, the tank. But you can use the tank in your household, wouldn't you? It might be useful. <laughs> Or the famous meme in the beginning of the war, Ukrainian woman giving sunflower seeds to a Russian soldier. The Russian soldier is surprised, why? Um, and the reply is when you fall to the ground, the seeds will fall out of your pockets and grow and I will have sunflowers next year. Um, another psychological operation is the program by journalist Zoltin where he interviews POWs uh, in the long interviews, 45, 50 minutes, asking very simple questions. Why did you come here? And very popular show currently in the Russian Federation. Include, and then he connects. There's a volunteer. They, they, would, they would not do it if the other side does not agree. These are conversations which are sometimes very painful to watch. Again, people on the other side who are looking for their um, relatives, connections, they're watching these shows in millions. The post stamp, which was issued by the Ukrainian state, was the soldier from the Snake Island, showing a middle finger and sending the Russian military ship to a particular direction, sold out. You cannot buy it anymore. It was one of those items. But it was, um, it was that meme that um, occupied a lot of attention and became sort of center of attention. Speaking about memes, I should mention, of course, TikTok, which is a different platform to Facebook or YouTube. Uh, TikTok has millions of followers of younger age. And uh, if you think who cares about TikTok, I, 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 would, I would invite you to think one more time. Um, apparently, according to my daughter, she informed me that her, in her school, there was a conversation in the first days of war. The president of the Russian Federation lost 5 million subscribers on his TikTok account. Russian Federation is quite active on TikTok. So Ukraine is now on the in the TikTok space too. And one of the most popular TikTok posts are actually dancing Ukrainian soldiers. It may sound sort of strange, but it is a cultural diplomacy of a sort because usually they dance to some cool Ukrainian tunes. But it's also about showing young, um, athletic, um, cool boys who should live. Um, and it sort of shows a human side of the defenders of the Ukrainian land. And um, huge, huge millions of young viewers around the world. So global outreach through TikTok. Can you, can you hear me all right? All fine. Excellent. Um, also, what happened in 2022 at diversifying communication channels. On the screen is a short from the Eurovision 2022. Um, you are following this event in Europe very closely. When I talk about it here, people are a little bit puzzled. They don't follow the Eurovision. It's an unknown music festival to them. But as you know, Ukraine is not new to winners. Uh, this year, Ukraine won by a landslide public vote. But why I'm bringing it here, because as you know, before the final, President Zelensky went on YouTube and addressed the people of Europe to support um, Ukrainian performers. And the stone, Stefania, is currently one of these modern symbols of Ukraine's resistance and fighting. A different diversification of communication channels happens actually around the first lady, Elena Zelenska, who went to the United States where she was approached by Vogue US. And um, she fronted the US edition of Vogue very recently. And you can see the link, you can read this article for free online. So it doesn't only exist in hard copy, it's online version open for all readers. What is interesting about this photograph, you can see Olena, who is obviously young and attractive, sitting in a rather masculine pose uh, in pants. Um, it, it's a masculine pose, right? Uh, plus she's not wearing high heels, wearing flats. You would think, who cares? The war is going on. 
Um, but in an interesting way, it actually triggered quite a negative reaction inside Ukraine saying that it's not feminine. Um, you know, the first lady should be wearing heels, proposed outfit, not these pants, not sitting like a man, not wearing flip. And that in its own case, it's the whole flash mob hashtag sit like a girl where Ukrainian journalists, Ukrainian professional women, Ukrainian models, Ukrainian mothers, and school children, school girls, they all went in this flash mob repeating the post, but also initiating a new conversation within a society that uh, we need to look into the role of women. The war means we are revising so many things in our life, and one of them is stereotypical outlook at how women should behave, what should they wear, how should they sit. So it's an interesting way, a, a good case to study um, to the, a revision of certain social roles, but also the role of social media in, in facilitating and amplifying this particular conversation. Sometimes Olena is called Ukraine's secret weapon. These are the photographs from the Vogue shoot where she is with um, her husband, but also when she's standing in front of the bombed and torn off plane, surrounded by female soldiers. Again, interesting article, you can read it online, but that's sort of not the end of it. In the United States, Elena goes to present to Congress, where she says, usually first ladies are asking for charity money, I'm asking for money to buy weapons, spending ovation, uh, big reception, big social media follow-up. And very recently, Elena actually was sent to represent Ukraine at the funeral of Queen Elizabeth, where she met with Kate Middleton, uh, before the funeral. And again, you would say, boy, who cares? She, and the media discussed what they were wearing, what designers, what shoes, what, and you say, seriously, there's war fighting going on. The argument here, and my argument too, there are plenty of readers who might not be interested in new weapons or counteroffensive or what type of tanks arrive to Ukraine. They will be interested in royals and Kate Middleton in fashion. And in this way, the profile of Ukraine will be raised um, among that particular audience. At the very end, I will say, and you will have to invite me one more time to develop this particular theme, that in addition to understanding all the information flows in the new media ecology, we should remember there's a very serious process of legislation happening on the background intended to protect Ukrainian cultural and information sphere from Russian influence. And this is something if you should remember, Ukrainian market is much smaller, it's around 41 million people, Russian market 141 million uh, consumers. So we are having bigger, um, bigger information production there, which is difficult to compete against. So Ukrainian information and cultural sphere need more protection. So since February 2022, we have a number of new laws which support Ukrainian culture, the crowdfunding initiative, um, getting rid of Russian narrative, sanctioning Russian propaganda agents, commemorating Ukrainian heroes, organizing archives, uh, strengthening Ukrainian information sphere, reaching out to Russian speakers and tightening control over providers of telecom services. So under each of these headings, there is a set of laws and I think in itself, it presents a separate lecture because you'll be really surprised of how much more, how, how, how much attention is currently paid to legislation to protect that sphere of Ukraine. And as we know, on the 23rd of June, 2022, the European Council decided to grant Ukraine the status of the candidate to the European Union, uh, become a member of the European Union. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen, no, Ukrainians are ready to die for the European perspective. We want them to live with us in the European Union. Volodymyr Zelensky replies a unique and historical moment. Ukraine's future is within the European Union. But with all the candidacy um, status, as we all know, comes a whole, um, whole package of certain reforms that should be implemented. And many of these reforms actually will concern the sphere of media, information and communication. These are not yet taking place, but in the near future, they will be taking place. And that's uh, a topic for yet another lecture invite me next year or even in a year. In this case, I will say, I will thank you for your attention. Um, that's, that's the end of my presentation. And I hope we can, I can turn off the projection and hopefully we can discuss and I will
return to my keyboard. So thank you. Thank you, Natalia. A big applause. As always, very, very interesting. There would be a lot of things I could say now, but I will first let the audience go ahead. Uh, just one remark <clears throat> that uh, our really reality is so different here. This is really because we, we start every day with the news about the war in Ukraine, about that Russian aggression in Ukraine and seeing what happened. And luckily at the moment, the, um, the successes of the Ukrainian army, we have a map every morning to see what had happened. We see every second day, the, the speech you mentioned by Zelensky. So these short videos uh, he's um, posting. So that's a real different, um, reality we both are living in or all of us are living in. Um, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions now I would also draw your attention because um, I have to look where she is. Yeah, Katarina uh, Saramo is here with us and uh, we are doing, by the way, a project on the role of um, electronic devices in, the, in war times in Ukraine, looking at how people use um, the technique as one part of our emergency city project. So there are a lot of things which are coming together here very well. So, but first, before I speak and ask, I would like to give the floor to the audience, please. Katarina, yeah. Dear Natalia, thank you very much for your very comprehensive and inspiring lecture. And I'm very happy to see you virtually again. Uh, I would like to ask a question uh, which um, I think is very important in appreciating the functions of the media uh, uh, in the context of the Russian aggression, uh, the Russian full-scale invasion now. Uh, as you know well, we have now the restriction on the public news. Yeah? So we have this uh, single marathon of, of news uh, which has been uh, competed by the bloggers you mentioned, yeah, the YouTube channel, the social media, but still in terms of traditional media, there is this restriction on the information. So I was wondering, you, you've presented this these functions of the media very nicely in the closer to the, to the beginning of your of your speech so how would you put this restriction in the context of the media function has there been more competition and more um, so to say uh, um, uh, so the delivery of the primary function then to the untraditional media or is this something that we should maybe analyze from a perspective which I'm currently not aware of. So would you please comment on that? Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. So if, um, if, if audience is not very familiar what marathon means, it means that um, by a special legislative act, um, Ukrainian uh, news media, those who different channels, they formed one big conglomerate in which they produce the news in a way in resonance with each other. And um, uh, this particular unit unites three, if I'm not mistaken, three private owned news networks and one state owned. It used to be private, you, uh, owned by Ahmed, who is the <coughs> apologies, um, an oligarch. But then he said, I don't want it anymore. And the state bought it from him. So we have three private owned media networks and one. Um, and um, and it, it is an interesting event. So first of all, there is a degree of criticism that in a true democratic society, there should be all sorts of opinions expressed and um, pluses, minuses discussed. Um, on the other side, um, we all know that at times of war, censorship is um, undertaken by the most democratic states. Uh, censorship was undertaken during World War II in the United Kingdom, in the United States. Um, war has different rules when it comes to forming the opinion. So um, this, uh, in this particular light, even though this is sort of a united production, because, and I'll say why it's still working, because they don't only broadcast using traditional media, it is because of the new media ecology, because they go online. We have, if you start reading the common commentary, so you still see that people can express all sorts of opinions. They can still debate with each other. They still comment on each other. So yes, 
in times of war, and I think it was quite unusual initiative, it, it, there are sometimes emergency measures and censorship is to be expected. So yes, that's sort of my view. And the fact that it does exist with the social media means that there is that element of democracy in place. Thank you, Veneta. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. And um, I'm also very happy to hear anything which uh, comes out of your analysis about Ukraine. Of course, here in Latvia, Ukraine is the topic. And, uh, and uh, we have, like, as in Germany every day, it's a basic news which we have. Only now, when we had the national elections last uh, weekend, then these were the first news <laughs> in the news. But otherwise, it's um, it's uh, Ukraine. But um, as you started the issue of censorship, uh, what I wanted to ask is about the self censorship of journalists, because what I see here in Latvia, uh, like all of the news are about Ukraine as a hero, like. Uh, Everything is perfect. Uh, Ukraine is uh, doing well. Uh, like the Ukrainian army is doing well. They are moving forward. Uh, the Russian army is uh, corrupt and they have problems with military management and so on and so on. So we see very clearly which is a good guy and which is a bad guy. And uh, I'm thinking uh, about um, about the journalists. So, that uh, in, they, in a way, they kind of uh, avoid publishing any news which could discredit the Ukrainian army, uh, any failures of Ukrainian army, any problems which are uh, which could be there in Ukraine with the provisions of the army or anything. It's just I think they just don't want to give any chance to Russia to use this information as something which they could present um, as fake news in Russia or among the uh, Russian speaking audiences here in Latvia. So there is a very big um, self-censorship of journals. Also, like uh, in Latvia as well, we, uh, we finally brought down the monument, monument of victory, which was, um, which was uh, there for many years and, uh, and uh, it was always an object of controversy here in Latvia because on the 9th of May it was a uh, very big demonstrations uh, at the monument and uh, Russian speaking uh, people were celebrating uh, and uh, there were many big debates for many years uh, to bring it down. All of a sudden when the war started they just brought it down and uh, very quickly, very quietly and forbidding all kind of uh, protests uh, around the monument and uh, we still have the law which prohibits any kind of demonstrations uh, around the monuments of uh, war of the Second World War, which is uh, understandable. At the same time, it kind of uh, restricts the, the human rights of people to, to, to gather. Uh, so and and the, and it's fine in the media. It's fine. Like the media doesn't talk about it. Uh, the journalists uh, they kind of um, follow this official course that it's fine. We finally did it, and uh, everything which could be related to any kind of uh, activities of Russian-speaking uh, people, uh, it's fine that we prohibit them. So, what do you think about the self-censorship of journalists uh, during the conflict and during war? Oh, thank you very much, English Veneta. It's very interesting to hear from sort of different different locations and different reflections because I bet there will be different stories in different member states. And so, what I want to say that, and it's following what Mick mentioned in the beginning, how Germany follows morning and evening the news, how Latvia follows. When I mentioned in the beginning that Western audience have sort of low patience when the threat is not perceived imminent, but when the threat is perceived very close, it will be the top news with some exceptions for elections and then it will go back because there is an existential threat and Latvia is too close and Germany is too close to the epicenter of the conflict. You cannot tune out, you are under the threat. So uh, there is a perception of threat which will never let you off the hook. Looking at locations further away, 
um, this is a little bit different because it's not only about knowledge, as we know, it's about perception. So how can you know, so we will uh, we might report, but not with the same intensity. So since your societies are their democratic, their liberal media environments, uh, obviously um, led by um, yeah, still media has to make profit. <laughs> media still has to <laughs> generate money in order to survive. So it's just it's sort of one thing is you have to be a watchdog. On the other side, you still have to sell the news. So lots of sort of different pressures. And it, it does indeed push a pressure on the journalists to self-censor themselves. And there is a combination of four factors. There is a polit journalists are members of the political, they understand the political priorities, pressures. They are connected themselves in their journalistic game to certain political forces within so in democracy the, the most because we have the press gallery in the parliament um, as soon as there is some sort of a big international conflict journalists immediately go to their context and government there is a lot of these connections between them so they understand the political pressures they understand the fact that they need to sell the news they they have economic pressure on themselves as well as on their, on their outlet they understand that they have values because they are members of a profession. They need to be objective, neutral. And then they are also individuals. Some of them like to write about the war. Some of them don't like to write about the war. Some of them like to write about sports. Um, so they have to balance between these four factors. And as soon as it starts, the self-censorship comes immediately. And it depends on the, on the role of a factor. And if this point of the threat is stronger, Political pressures may be stronger. And it's it's always happens. They all sort of like connected vessels. You look at any democratic media system, there will be all sorts of pressures. So I'm not surprised that uh, Latvian journalists are sort of exercising self-censorship because they understand the, the complexity of the issue. But I want to come back to my initial point that um, narratives could be different in different member states. And there is a very good research, and I think if Katerina is still here, I think Katerina has tuned out, she's one of the authors of a very interesting article about narratives by academics and think tanks on the war in Ukraine. They found some significant differences between how Italy, Germany, and France frame vis-a-vis -vis Scandinavian and Baltic and Polish. And it's, it's a very interesting article which demonstrates that within the European Union, there is a diversity in narratives and how the conflict is presented, even how it's named um, and what is the foreseen outcome is very different. So that's something to keep in mind. There is, uh, there is no one story within Europe. So we cannot expect that every member state will have a dominant un united narrative with the rest of the member states. That's another interesting point to discuss in the, in the research. Thank you, Sharon. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Natalia. It's always uh, a pleasure uh, to listen to your great ideas. Um, I just uh, I should uh, add uh, one comment to what Mick uh, just said when she opened the lecture, and she said that you're clearly the queen of perception studies. I would argue that you're the queen mother of uh, <laughs> the perception <laughs> studies, and it has nothing to do with age. Um, so. Uh, uh, so, so thank you very much for that. Uh, as for the breadth uh, perception, um, I must say that here in Israel, for example, uh, uh, the war is no longer covered uh, in the first uh, 20 minutes of any news, uh, news edition. It's somewhere towards the end of, 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 uh, of the news edition. Uh, same goes for, for the printed media and for uh, the online media. So I, I, it really supports your main argument uh, regarding the threat perception. Um, the, my question actually goes to your theoretical argument regarding the virtual diplomacy that is being used. I wonder why would you argue that this is of any, any difference at all uh, from digital diplomacy? And would you argue that we need a different theoretical framework than soft power uh, for virtual diplomacy? Thanks. Oh, thank you, Sharon. Always a pleasure to, to exchange a good question. I think um, digital diplomacy has so many different definitions and um, 
it could be seen as a tool for for policy and decision makers to contact each other and talk to each other like they talk on Zoom. And also that they um, sort of use digital diplomacy for social media, um, sort of the general public base, and they amplify the number of receivers. What, what we're observing in case of Zelensky is the blurring of these boundaries. And this is something not yet theorized. And that's why I find it so fascinating. Yes, it is an appearance of an elite to, the, elite, to elite, leader to the policymakers. So, yeah, formally digital diplomacy in its peer case. But, yeah, so, okay, not head to state. Anyway, so it's sort of that elite dimension. But because it gets such a broad coverage in traditional media, and then so much following on the social media, it transcends the boundary of digital diplomacy of leaders using internet to talk to each other in a closed virtual room, since it not open for the public, therefore elite consumption um, or negotiation or decision-making. Here we are, and that's, and that's fascinating for me because there is not enough theory. And so, yes, you're right. The soft power is not enough now. So we are now, the, te te the technology aspect um, and that sort of multi-layering offers us something different. And um, yeah, I don't have a word for this, but the blurring of boundaries suggests that soft power is already a little bit of an outdated concept. But what is next? But maybe we could talk more <laughs> and use that case as push to push for something different. Yes. I'm game. <laughs> Can I, Natalia, can I just follow up there? Because I was wondering myself, why do you call it vertical? Because vertical is uh, in our imagination always something which is, uh, has a hierarchy, you know, like vertical. Virtual, 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 virtual. 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 I, I understood. Virtual. Ah, virtual. Yeah. Okay. Because virtual. isn't it more transnational, something like that? Because the idea of transnational was society to society. It's a bit not so good because it's uh, it's um, the statesman to statesman and others, but would it, you know, put the focus away from the the medium that it's virtual more to or virtual transnational or something to the way it goes, something like mm -hmm. that. It does because it trans uh, the nation. It is transnational because it's sort of transcends the national borders in a way that it didn't do before. So it's yet another feature. So I think it's something to think about, but no, it's not vertical. It is virtual, yeah, sorry, but I it is not it down completely uh, wrong. Because what I didn't put on the slides is too much information because he addresses also general public. There were big addresses to rallies in Italy, for example. So there is more to that virtual diplomacy when he actually talks to people, so transnational. This is what was, more, was making me think of transnational because it's more than that it's only the medium is different than before. It's the audience yeah. is different and the way- The audience is different too. And communicating, yeah. You see, I should have included that his general public addresses, I felt, I felt I should have, <laughs> but it, it's something unheard of when a group huge thousands of people are standing in a different state and the leader of a different state addresses them with passionate speech. And um, when he addressed the general public in Italy, he actually talked about children who died in the war and he, because, you know, this is one of the family, family is one of the big values for the Italian society, well, for everybody, but um, yeah. Natalia, just to add that he actually also addressed the general public in Tel Aviv, a large audience in Tel Aviv. As you know, he actually lived in Israel for a while. Uh, and he also addressed the uh, audience of students at the Hebrew University. Here you go. So he, he's really doing that, not only the policy makers, decision makers, but different stakeholders, as I mentioned, opinion makers, he really values those who create the, the stories. Um, and what was you can say the, the general public? I think this the whole virtual diplomacy case is a very fascinating. So if somebody would like to join me in digging deeper, please join me. Alrighty, yeah, Veneta. Oh, Thank you, Natalia. Can I have one more question? <laughs> yeah, um, from the point of view of the theory of strategic narratives, um, it seems that um, Zelensky has uh, used very well 
all the instruments to form a powerful strategic narrative and to project it in uh, media ecology. Uh, what do you think? Do you think it's just a very successful strategy? How to do it? Or oh, it's the personality of uh, Zelensky himself which uh, made it so successful? His strategic narrative. Why was it so success successful? Just because of the strategy or because of himself as a person? So it's interesting because um, in the narrative of a victim was quite a powerful, and I, even I wrote an article on how the narrative of a victim was used as a strategic narrative by Ukraine for a long time on, on projecting onto international actors saying that Ukraine is under attack, you need to help with you. And how the 2022 events turned the narrative from Ukraine from a victim to Ukraine, a hero, a fighter. And what is interesting, there is this another research um, looking into the brands for for business, not not the not the soft power brand, but a different branding research. Nation brand is a big field, and so they found out that Ukraine's brand. So they have already empirical evidence that Ukraine's brand changed, and very rarely you can see how nation brand can shift in such a quick time. So. One of the answers, of course, coming from the fact that that strategic narrative obviously has been pitched well and projected well. So my argument is, I will come back, it's not, well, Zelensky is a one human being who is working insane hours. Yes, he has charisma, he has, he, he presents well, he's very sincere and people feel it, but it's just not enough. So he has a very interest. So there was recently a very interesting publication in Ukrainian media about his speech writers. So there's a whole team of speech writers working with him who are very intelligent, educated, traveled. Uh, the world have world look outlook. So there are speech writers working with him. I mentioned several people who are sort of the called advisors to the president or advisors to the office. They are professional communicators, journalists, bloggers, strategic communicators. These people also understand the rules of the, of the engagement uh, that you need to engage differently in the 21st century and using different tools. And I think um, yeah, there is this um, collegiate atmosphere, as far as I understood in the team, the office of the president, they're really dynamic. They, they um, yeah, so it's a, it's a different communication model if you look on the, on, on, on the side of the Russian Federation. Um, so I suppose this is my quick answer. The, the answer is that he is, Zelensky is good as a communicator, but he's good as a person. People know he's loyal to the team and he has an excellent team around him who, um, who are working with him very well and understand the value of communication rather than not understanding it. And by the way, if you didn't know, Olena Zelenska was one of his text writers when um, he was performing as a satirical writer. So his wife herself is a speech writer. Yeah. Okay. Another information I didn't know. So <laughs> thank you very much for that really so rich uh, talk today in the morning and so interesting and inspiring. Again, a big applause. You cannot hear it. We cannot hear it. You can hear mine. <laughs> but thank the you. applause is yours. You can be sure. Thanks a lot, Natalia, for today's um, speech here. And I will call you Queen Mum now. Uh, I learned <laughs> that from Sharon. <laughs> and not no, in we, have one, we have one big family of people who love receptions. <laughs> <laughs> and not in an age-wise way. So thank you very much. We will continue our program today at about three. Um, virtually from Latvia <laughs> uh, about energy. Uh, energy and the war against Ukraine. And uh, then we will have uh, a talk tonight, but in German because it's reaching out to the civil society and that's not working in English in Germany. So unfortunately that one is in German about energy, the new energy poverty led by myself. And uh, we will have uh, really interesting discussion because actually that war and the, the crisis around uh, energy is hitting Germany very hard and other European countries too. And we will talk about that. And then this e-cost half week has ended. 
Um, Natalia, there were already people asking, can you send us the slides? Can we distribute the slides and put them on the... On sure. the um, they sort of just slides right without the much text on them, but yeah, I'm happy to send the slides. Yeah. And just send them to me before you go to bed. Thank you a lot for being with us in such a late evening in New Zealand. And hello to everybody and thank you for joining. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for bye organizing bye. and thank you for great questions. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye.